today we have a small talk about the pursuit of developer experience. Uh, my colleague Ivan Krnic, who is the director of engineering at Cross, and myself, Kreshmir Musa, I'm a CTO at Cross. We will talk about this pursuit of developer experience through uh, a couple of very interesting scenarios that we found in our own environment, and we will also try to share our experience about how we tried to solve these uh, painful sources of frustration within our teams. Uh, we solved some of them with technology, we solved some of them uh, with maybe some other methods, but Ivan will guide you through uh, these very interesting scenarios in the rest of the talk. Ivan, please. Thank you, Kresho. Hello, everyone. We have some more people joining. So, as, as Kresho said, we, we come from Cross. We are a software development consultancy. Uh, many people claim that their organizations are, are special ones, are, are, are in a way unique. Uh, I would argue that we are not that special and we are not that unique, and that we are pretty much very similar to many of your organizations here. We started small, like 30, 40 people, and we had internal organization that suited our needs very well. But then uh, it's all fun and games when you're small uh, until you get to an organization this large. So this is like something like 300 people. And now it's not that easy anymore. And this internal organization that worked well for us in the beginning didn't work well, well for us uh, further on. Uh, I have to admit that during this scaling process, we committed exactly all scaling rookie mistakes that all organizations make in terms of onboarding new people, in terms of supporting existing teams, in terms of providing technical prerequisites for these people to work. Uh, it, it just happened like that. And it didn't make our people happy, especially developers. So things like this happened uh, a lot. And this is certainly not the experience that you want to provide your people. And we started looking at what can we do better, so how can we improve. This is the quote that I found somewhere. I don't know who I should credit it to, so if maybe somebody knows who said this, please let me know. But it's so true. It says companies above 1,000 employees don't need clients at all. So they will generate enough work on their own to keep themselves fully busy all the time. So when you, when you grow enough, you, you have so many of these things that you should do internally. You're spinning the wheel all the time, and it seems like you're not delivering anything. And uh, there is somebody, thank you, by the way, everybody who, who ha hanged out with us these days on this punching bag. Uh, one guy told us that he said to, to his boss, listen, if all internet broke down today and we had no electricity or anything, I would personally have enough things to do for the next three months. So <laughs> I think that he found himself also in, in this quote. And uh, we also recognized a bit ourselves in, in this quote and uh, we decided that we need to do something so it cannot be like this anymore. And we did some improvements and many of the improvements that we did uh, were based on these books. So dynamic reteaming and team topologies. We heard a lot about team topologies today, so I won't go into those details of, of team topologies. And lately, we learned a lot from Investments Unlimited, uh, which I strongly recommend if you haven't read so far to take a look. It gives some of the very interesting scenarios that we all in, in large organizations should, uh, should take into account. And one thing that, that we took uh, away from, from especially this team topologies uh, thing is that this cognitive load. So what happens is we, we try to improve, but you know how that works in practice. So every improvement in the end ends up as an additional step, as an additional check, as an additional reminder. And sooner than you know it, you end up in a sea of additional checklists, reminders, things to, to read before you do something. And all of that produces additional cognitive load 
on, on the organization. And not all cognitive load is the same, as Manuel and Matthew say. So what we want to do is minimize this intrinsic cognitive load. We want to completely eliminate, ideally, or at least minimize this extraneous cognitive load in order to make more space for germane cognitive load. And germane cognitive load is the one that we want to have. So this is truly delivering value and, and solving problems for our clients. And we went on a quest to eliminate this extraneous cognitive load, particularly in the domain of developer experience. So we wanted to make this experience much smoother and much more seamless for, for our developers. Uh, there are, I was just commenting yesterday, like a million downsides of giving a talk on the last day of the conference, basically last slot before, before the last keynote, but there is one huge upside, and that is the opportunity to hear all other talks and all other opinions and hang out with you outside and, and listen to these stories. And I had a chance to talk with James Ward on, on Monday. It was over beer on a boat. Uh, we spoke for an hour and I asked him, so what do you think, what is this developer experience that we will talk about on, on Wednesday? And uh, James's take on developer experience is, it's not about feelings, it's about productivity. So we want to make productivity first class citizen in, when, when we talk about developer experience. It's not about fruit on the table, it's not about table tennis, it's not about pinballs, it's about productivity. And then I was also uh, very much uh, uh, this talk was, was great for me by Fabio yesterday and, and he talked about this seamless experience that technology should provide. He said exactly technology should remove the friction and this also resonated with us a lot because this is what we were trying to do when we did all these improvements in the, in the organization. And if you happen to, to walk by a Red Hat stand, and if they give you a, a nice stickers, these are the stickers that you will get. So if you can see here also developer joy, uh, both of these stickers are actually aiming at uh, saving some time for these developers. So how can they do their job frictionless and seamless and without m much of a hassle so they can just get on with it and do their work. And these ideas and these thoughts and these conversations reassured us a little bit for this talk today that maybe we actually are on the right track uh, focusing ourselves on improving this developer experience and doing something for, for the people in this area. Uh, and what we try to do is to take into account the whole developer journey of a one developer from the point when this person joins the company till all other moments later and to figure out what happens in specific touch points in this journey and let's see what we can do internally in our company to make their lives easier and to improve this developer experience. And we stumbled upon several uh, very interesting touch points and in these touch points we did some tweaks and we improved this developer experience a bit. Some of these touch points, in some of these touch points, we were able to completely automate this cognitive load that needs to happen, this extraneous cognitive load. In some of them we didn't succeed in, in automating it all the way, but it made us, it made, we made it much easier to reach the right decisions what to do in those moments. For some of those automations, uh, we ended up with a tool. For some of them, we ended up with a visualization. But in each of these touch points, we were able to move the needle a little bit. And hopefully, by compounding the effect, we were able to do something significant for us in the last couple of years. So I will walk you through a couple of these scenarios, through, through these touch points. Uh, and since I said in the beginning, we don't feel like very special. So we are truly an ordinary organization. And I think that some of these touch points will actually resonate with you. And if some of these scenarios will inspire you 
to look for the similar cognitive load in your organizations, then I think that both of us have succeeded here in, in this talk. So the first one, the first touch point that we found is what happens when new hire is coming to the organization. So uh, you remember maybe those situations when new hire comes to the organization and it is left to their own devices. There's nobody to help them get more familiar with the team, with the project, uh, with the mission of the organization, uh, doesn't even know where the printer, network printer is. Uh, he's left alone with a bunch of documentation, which was updated a couple of years ago for the last time. And in every case, when we had this situation, it didn't turn out well. So when person comes to the company and when this person is left to their own devices, not working, we tried. What on the other hand works excellent is when this person gets a buddy in the beginning. So somebody who is dedicated to this person, somebody who will help them get more familiar with the company, with all the projects, uh, with all the technologies, with all those hidden experts inside the company who sh you should know so you can ask questions and, and so on. So, it's very easy. Uh, works well when you have a body, doesn't work well when you don't have a body. But the trouble is that not all new hires got their bodies in the beginning. So what can we do to ensure that every new hire gets its body uh, when, when joining the company? So we automated, in a way, automated it, but we made it very explicit and very visible in our onboarding process. So now, when a new person joins the, the team, there is an onboarding process that happens, and here we need to choose who the body of this person will be. So in this way, we make sure that every new hire gets their body, and uh, it works much, much better from, from that point on. So it wasn't that we didn't know this before, it was that this wasn't visible to us. And I'm sure that a lot of problems are exactly like this. So if somebody shows you the problem, then you will know that there is a problem. But you need to make this problem explicit and you need to keep it front and center and, and to be able to, to actually address it and, and solve it. So what happens once we have new hire onboarded? So we would probably want this new hire to hit the ground running on, on day one. Yeah. So what does it mean? You, we all know about Etsy. We would all want to be like Etsy. So we would all want to have our new hires deploy changes to production on the first day. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't happen very often uh, because of many reasons. And, and one of these reasons are some of the technical prerequisites that each new hire needs to have. So for example, uh, all the permissions and access rights to all the systems that uh, so he can push new code in the Git repo so he can trigger some continuous delivery and, and so on. So this happened in one of our teams uh, at one client in financial, insti one financial institution in the financial sector. Uh, this is our all time record. So it took one month and 13 days for our team to get all the right and necessary access rights and permissions to be able to push something to test production. So you can imagine what kind of waste of time this is when you have people almost idling for 43 days until they get all those access rights and permissions to push something and be productive. So uh, we wanted to, to put the end to, to it and this is, this is bad enough for, for us old people here on the stage uh, who are maybe millennials and, and digital pioneers. But I'm sure it's even worse for Gen Z and these are the people who are our new colleagues today. So new hires are mostly Gen Z people. And they were born into a world of big technological innovation. So they are true digital natives. And we could, this friction in the technology can maybe get away with us old people, but Gen Z is very sensitive to friction. 
and uh, they have a very low tolerance for these legacy technology issues. So if there is some kind of a friction, like for example, waiting for 43 days to get permissions and access rights to do something that they really want to do, but they can, it's, it becomes a, a problem, both for our uh, productivity, but also for our employee branding. It's not that we old people, again, uh, enjoy this, this idling. We also hate those things. We maybe call them a little bit differently. So we talk about lean software development process. So we talk about value adding activities, which is basically coding. We talk about non value adding activities, which we should completely remove. But we also talk about these value enabling activities. So all those things that you need to do in order to deliver value to your clients. And one of these things that are value enabling activities for us is actually what I said already, providing all necessary access rights and permissions to all the systems so these people who want to work, so we enable them to work. We let them work, do their best. And we, we had these situations where, for example, new, new hire Anna, for example, need to get access rights to all those systems to the right. And there is a huge number of possible roles in all of these systems. So uh, what is she to do? To open a service desk ticket, like Bob did it before a couple of slides, and ask for which permissions? She doesn't know that. So we did a bit of an automation here. So once Anna joins the new team, the system will automatically provision all the right access rights and roles to all these external systems, and Anna will be able to hit the ground running on, on day one. So her joining the team will trigger this provisioning of all these access rights to all the appropriate systems, and she will be able to hit the ground running on day one. And it basically works like this, so just to get a feeling of the, of the granularity, so we can control on the level of these permissions for a particular system. So each time Anna, in the role of a developer, joins the team, she will get all these permissions and access rights to, to all these systems. And this made this onboarding process from a technical point of view even smoother and made people much happier when they switched teams or joined new teams. So what happens next in their, in their developer journey? Third touch point that we analyzed was uh, people growing in the, in the organization. It's not particularly one single specific touch point, but it is what happens after a couple of these initial steps. And we want to be, make sure that these people grow as an individuals inside the teams, inside the organization. Uh, so what we did generally before is use all sorts of facilitation tools and one of these is probably familiar to, to, to most of you. It's called skills map. So it is when you have this flip chart and you put down all the skills that you need in your team, and then you self-assess or jointly assess your skills on this map. And uh, it's done periodically, and you see if you miss some skills uh, personally, do you want to grow in, in some other direction as well? And this is then uh, a conversation starter for the team, for the line managers, and for everybody in the organizations to see in which direction we want this person to grow. So this proved as a, as a pretty, nice, uh, pretty nice tool, analog tool, and we wanted this also to be available to all the teams. Uh, and we did it also by implementing it in a tool as a digital skill map. So now every person has their own skill map, and they can choose the skills, they can self-assess where do they stand on these skills in their own opinion. And then this is also a conversation starter for the team and the retrospectives to see which, in which direction certain people would like to go, should go, and how does, do they stack against all others in the team, and do we, as a, as a team, jointly have enough skills for, to, to do the project or build the product that we are looking for. So one dimension is team growth, but if we zoom out a little bit, uh, one dimension is people growing, but if we zoom out a little bit, we, we have teams growing in the same way. So we also want to keep track on how do we do as a team. So if we are going to move to another service that we want to, to build, 
uh, maybe you need some other skills. So I need some kind of mechanism to see if, if, if I have all the necessary skills. So it is pretty much similar. What we want to achieve is to have this digital version of all those tools that we were using in our coaching sessions. So instead of flip charts and putting things down uh, with Sharpies, we wanted to have this available to everybody, uh, documented, always here, always present, not worrying about whether somebody left the window open and draft uh, took everything away from the walls. And this is what, what we came with. And uh, this is what teams use now. Uh, yeah, what, what happens next? So we covered onboarding, we covered uh, new hire starting up, we hired growth, and we have teams in the organization. Uh, currently at Cross, we have something like 17 or 18 teams. And these teams, of course, interact. Nobody lives in isolation. And uh, no, since j just like no two pieces of work are the same in the organization, uh, and, and so, so is the interaction mode between these teams. And in the interaction mode between these teams can also change from time to time and from circumstances to circumstances. Uh, here, we, we used uh, a lot of insights from this book, Dynamic Reteaming, by Heidi Helfand. And in this book, uh, she describes five major five fundamental reteaming patterns that happen in the organization. So for example, person leaves the team or joins the team. This is one by one. So somebody, single person joined or left the team. There is this grow and split model when you have a team that is growing, 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 and at some point becomes so large that you just need to split it. Isolation is something that we also used uh, a, a little bit less. And it's a pattern when you want to do, for example, some kind of R&D initiatives. So you want to isolate a couple of people, leave them alone, give them enough space and enough focus for them to, to do something useful and meaningful. Merging is when you have a couple of teams merge into one. And switching is when two people from two teams switch their places. So this usually comes handy when you have people who want to try something new, they want to uh, test themselves in, in a new environment, on a new service with a new project, and then it's pretty common for, to find somebody else in that other team and just have those two people switch. And this is all fine, and these patterns work, and uh, I believe that we used them even before we knew how they were called uh, in this book. But what happens sometimes is uh, that Unfortunately, our systems do not keep track of what happens on the team level. And uh, this is an email that one of our colleagues got. Uh, it says here, it's written in Croatian, and it says here, subject is new password, and the content is, your Active Directory password is reset to blah, 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 something. And this was, he got this email uh, from our client, and this email was sent quarterly, so every quarter, somebody will reset the Active Directory password. It's a security feature. And it's a great security feature uh, if there wasn't, if, <laughs> if this person was actually working on this project. So this colleague was not working on this project for four years, and nobody knew that he wasn't working on that project. So all those permissions that he got were left, and uh, he was treated like he was actually on that project. And I'm sure you can relate to that. When you, when you open up some tool, some visualization, and you find like 50 people have access to some project, and when you go to the room, you find four people working on it. And all this is some overhead that was collected along the, along the years. So is there a way that we can detect these unnecessary permissions and pr prune them? So uh, there should be some kind of a way. And we actually use the same automa automation that we use for, for provisioning permissions. We use the same mechanism to understand which people do not work anymore on these projects. So we can, and when these, or when these people offboard the team, then we can take away all those permissions from them. And this uh, keeps us in a very, very synchronized state 
from a technical point of view and security point of view in comparison to the structure of the teams. And uh, this was very cool and uh, we, we had a lot of positive feedback even from, from our clients to keep track like this, uh, especially for this offboarding that happens. Sometimes offboarding is actually a bigger problem than onboarding, especially with those permissions that are left on the, on the project. Uh, yeah, teams, teams interact. Uh, as I said, they don't work in isolation, so we need to have a way for these teams to, to work uh, together. Uh, as I said, not all work is the same, not all interactions models are the same, and uh, Matthew and Manuel talk a lot about those three interaction models collaboration, access a service, and facilitation, you need to be very mindful which one do you want to use for a particular situation. But how can one team uh, know how to get into contact with other team? And this is something that uh, Manuel and Matthew talk a lot about in, in team topologies, and they argue for a concept called team API. So it's basically like a technical API of a service, so you want to have those details where, just like you have details, of the interfaces of a particular service, so you want to have a description of the interfaces of a team. So some of the data that you could use in this team APIs, team name, uh, team purpose, what are they focusing on, uh, are they a platform team or not, do they provide service to other teams, uh, which components are maintained by this team, uh, what versioning system uh, syntax do they use, and, and so on. Uh, most of all, when you can reach them and how you can reach them, on which channels and at which time. And this is something that resonated with us a lot. And uh, so we built in this team routines feature so every team can put their uh, specific data about when their team routines are. So when do they have their dailies, when do they have their backlog roamings, when do they have their retrospectives or other, other such touch points where other, when other teams can connect with them, when other teams can join them, and when other teams can share their, their problems and ask for help. And uh, this team API is something that uh, engaged a lot of people and a lot of teams uh, e enabled this engagement and uh, made this communication much easier once they knew where to look for, for help. Another touch point that we investigated is governance. So, uh, as you saw, we grew from 30-something people to 40-something people, to 300 people, and uh, sooner or later, you will end up with somebody who is security officer asking questions like this. So, you walk through the corridor, you see Bob, and you ask yourself, hmm, this Bob guy, what can he access today in our company? And in 90-something percent of cases, the answer is, I don't have a clue. And there is no single point, single pane of glass, single, single screen when you can see this data. And, and you don't actually, you, you can collect this data from many other systems and then merge these, this data together and find this, this information. And as much as we thought that it was our personal problem, it wasn't. So this is a, a piece from this book, Investments Unlimited. And I love this book. It was published by IT Revolutions, the same people who published the Phoenix Project and, and all other great DevOps books. And uh, Michelle, she is a team leader. Uh, this struck me. Uh, team leads and managers grant approval left and right. We don't have a way to track elevated access requests. So, uh, this gave us reassurance that this is not, we are not the only ones dealing with these problems, that other companies are actually having these problems as well. So, do all companies have these problems? I'm sure that there will certainly be some startups and small companies uh, thinking like, we don't need to manage this onboarding and permissions and whatever, we trust our people. Uh, we, we give them permissions to everything and know, they know what they, how they need to behave. 
and we just give them access to everything. But the, the sad truth is that not all organizations are like this one here. And, and many of us are enterprises with hundreds of people. And we have some commitments both to us and to our clients, and we have some regulatory obligations. And some of us have ISO 27001 and audits and data privacy and GDPR and whatever. And we cannot function like that John Hotshot. And we need to move fast by respecting those, all those commitments. And, and this is why we took this uh, governance part seriously. And what we did is, uh, since we know how to give permissions to people, and since we know how to remove permissions for people, we wanted to have this mechanism of keeping an activity log based on events. So at any point in time, we can basically replay what happened in the, in the past and find out how exactly did we end up in this situation, uh, who gave what permissions, when, how, in which way, on what resources. And uh, uh, auditors, of course, love this, and security officers. So this is one of the, one of the things that really made our life and our collaboration with, with security people much more interesting. And this is all built uh, as an evolution of our internal development platform that we are using. So Kresha will tell us a little bit about yep. this internal platform. So uh, this might also be a good place to do uh, a little shout out to our friends from a company called Axon IQ. I'm sure many of you know this company and all are and all the people in it. Uh, we actually met them here at GoTo a couple of years ago, and they introduced us to this great little piece of technology called Axon Framework. Uh, it made us, uh, it enabled us to do what we wanted to do with these scenarios that even just presented. So in order for being able to, in order to be able to provide support for, for example, tracking the audit logs and, and providing all the events that happened in the system, we needed a solution like Axon framework to, to give us the ability to, to track all the events, to be able to replay them and provide that level of integration throughout the whole system. So uh, us being a software company like many of you here, you can imagine that we, of course, have something like this in our, in our internal environment, a platform like many of you are for sure having. And that's perfectly fine and normal for, for all of us. But to be able to provide the level of automation for the scenarios that Ivan just described, we needed to do something more. And in the end, we ended up building an additional component which was supposed to provide us the level of automation that we showed you. In the previous slides, uh, we used everything you use these days to provide those levels of Automation, of course, Axon being the central, central point in it. For the things that we could not automate, we tried to provide a good level of support for, uh, for data visualization so we can track in that way what happens in the system. Ivan. Yeah, and this is a, a sneak preview of, of one of the other, <laughs> other features that we are working on right now. So. Uh, it's, it's based on uh, trying to find a way to improve ourselves in, in the area of value streams. So you know that we would all want to have more capacity and do more work. And in the beginning, when you are small, perhaps the best way to increase the capacity is to increase your headcount. And by increasing your headcount, you are basically multiplying your capacity. But this works up to a certain point, and when you grow, large enough, maybe adding more people is not the best way to increase the capacity. The better way would probably be to improve the flow of the value through the organization. And we want to remove that friction in the delivery process. And we want to be able to, for example, detect situations such as this one. So where we are building a product or a service, and we have actually three teams working on, on this, this product, and we have some handovers of work, and this is all, those are all the places where work slips through the cracks and, uh, and friction happens. So maybe, just maybe, it makes sense to detect situations like this one, 
and maybe it makes sense to reorganize a little bit. So maybe we could do better by, by having a dedicated team that works on this product. This way we won't have any, any uh, handovers. We will have one team that is focused on, on one, one product. So this all sounds cool. If only there was a way for me to recognize these situations. And this is one of the, one of the things that we are experimenting with right now. Uh, this, is, this is not Milky Way. So this is visualization uh, of work and people that happens at Cross right now. So this is based on hard data from, from Git repository. And all these blue dots are projects, and all these yellow dots are teams and people. So we want to have insight into what really happens in, in our company and to recognize those situations. So we want to recognize situations in which we have one team working on a number of blue dots. This is not a good situation. This is a warning sign. So we need to be extra careful about these situations. We also want to be mindful of other situations in which many yellow dots are working on one blue dot. So this means, this is the situation that I described before. So we have, do we really need to have 10 teams working on one product? Maybe we need a dedicated, dedicated team for that. And this is what we are currently working on. Uh, and what is truly cool about this is that it's based on real data from external systems. It is not based on 10 people coming to the room and drawing something uh, from their memory. This is based on, a, on a real data, and it gives us a nice perspective. To wrap things up, so we tackle this, this uh, problem of improving the developer experience from two perspectives. One perspective is a social one, where we wanted to increase the feeling of belonging to the team and the organization, to support personal growth of people, to have this smoother developer experience through all those touch points that we mentioned throughout the talk, and to support this learning and sharing culture, Western culture, generative one. Uh, also, from the operational technical point of view, we wanted to, to get some savings with faster onboarding and offboarding of people. We wanted to automate many things like roles and permission management. For those governance part, we wanted to have this centralized view of resource usage and traceability of those. And we finally wanted to have a proper team up, since we do share people between teams, and this is something that needs to be taken care of. And as I said, it's great when you hear some other talks here on the conference. Huge shout out to ING guys who are here on Monday. And, and I really love their talk, and, and it stuck with me also their vision of in which direction will this team organization move forward. Uh, make teams small and they work simple. So just like these microservices are taking the world over and we are lowering the granularity, so it will happen with the teams also. And this is super cool and this is, uh, I see this as a super useful, but I also see that some kind of uh, automation and care about these teams and synchronization of team structure to the, those other external systems will be needed more than ever. Because if we take this to another level and, and we have many more teams with these dynamics much more increased, uh, I'm afraid that if we don't pay attention, all of us, to, to removing this cognitive load, not to do these things manually but to automate them, I feel like we will end up in a, in a pretty bad place. So uh, I, I like this a lot and I, I feel like this is giving also reassurance to us that, that uh, this, this is the direction that the whole industry should be at least looking at and see what will happen in, in this direction. Thank you so much for listening to us. <laughs>